Hi everyone, hi again. Oh, hi, Biggie. Hi, Ash. Hi, sir. Hi. Hello, everyone. It's good to see you. Hi. It's good to see you too, my friend. Yes, I finally worked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Little problem with updates, but now everything seems to be working. Yeah, great. Okay, so the big topic, TA and psychoanalysis. Quite an interesting conversation we have today, huh? <laughs> yeah, and we didn't plan for it, but it seems like it's Freud's birthday today. Did you know that? It is, it is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, but we, we didn't think about it. So it's interesting. How so, appropriate like, it is, you know, yeah. burn. Uh, Byrne actually uh, said something very similar to what Lacan said, uh, also said, which is that he was uh, more Freudian than the psychoanalysts of his environment, of his time. And Lacan yeah. said something not exactly the same, but along those lines as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I've read that. And... Uh, it's interesting that that we can start with Freud now. It's because I, everything it starts with him in psychoanalysis. So <laughs> maybe that's not so inappropriate to start with this place. So, but before right. before we start the discussion, I just uh, want to say why I was thinking about doing this talk and having this live talk and the idea came about my personal uh, came from my personal confusions in my readings and in my training because since the beginning I was very interested in uh, psychoanalysis and reading different theories and different ideas from Freud to modern psychoanalysis and besides that reading uh, TA from classical school to the relational school and how each one of um, schools or each theorists actually uh, relates to one of the psychoanalytic theories. And there was many, many confusions, I can say. Uh, starting from Freud, it has a lot of confusion. Eric Byrne has a lot of confusion. And I thought maybe if we just talk about that, maybe can, we can make it a little bit more clear for uh, other people who want to read maybe or who want to do that, especially that you are coming from a psychoanalytic background. And it's very interesting to me to talk to you and uh, actually learn and see how, see in your lens and your point of view uh, how was your experience uh, starting a TA training and reading TA books and materials from the beginning? So that's where the, actually the idea came from. Uh, yeah, I think so. At this point, we can start. Uh, let me just ask about a little bit about your background and maybe you can introduce yourself before we okay. yeah, go to this session. So, uh, I'm Luis Filippi. Um, that's actually a double name in Portuguese. Uh, would be equivalent to Luis and Philip in English. And, uh, well, I'm a psychoanalyst. And uh, for the past year or so, I've been uh, doing a lot of TA training. And that's actually how we met, right, Ash? So... Um, I've been a psychoanalyst for the past 12 years. I have a master's in uh, psychoanalysis. I have training as a, a psychoanalyst for adults and for children. I'm familiar with, um, well, I, uh, my, my main schools of preference are the French school and also the English school of psychoanalysis. I do have, you know, some knowledge of other schools, not really very deep, of course, because you always choose one and, or two and then yeah. you, you go deeper, right? And, um, and the, the, the way I got involved with TA is, is actually uh, quite curious um, because, you see, I, 
Um, I'm an Alan Parsons fan. And uh, and they have a song called "Games People Play," and I just love that song. Oh, and then and then one day I subscribed to a book summary service. It's called Twelve Minutes, and then they had a summary of Games People Play, and I uh, and I was actually working out. And I played <laughs> that summary, and I was like, "Whoa, this is really interesting! I have to read this book." And needless to say, I started reading games people play, and I was completely blown away by um, the concepts that I read there. And um, mm. I started, uh, well, I guess I'm already uh, talking about other things. So I'm going to stop here and, and, and ask if there's anything you would like to ask me before I proceed. Well, I think that was a good point you were mentioning because game. I want to ask games people play. Um, I want to say actually, games people play is a difficult book. It's not a really simple book to start with, and uh, it's interesting to see that you were attracted to the theory from reading that book, um, and then you started to start a training, right? It's it's quite curious that you say that games people play is not a is not a simple book um, because uh, you know I'm already used to psychoanalytic literature and it's really oh, yeah. really hard. <laughs> so for me, I thought games people play was actually quite simple, and it was one of the things that attracted me to TA. You know because burn. Um, well, it all started with Bern uh, being frustrated in his dream of being uh, recognized as a psychoanalyst by uh, the psychoanalytic society of his um, of, of his city. And uh, let me begin by clarifying that psychoanalysis today um, is very different and a lot more diverse than it was in his time. Yeah. And especially, I think the, there is access to different schools. Were Bern to live in our times, he would have found his niche and he would have been considered a psychoanalyst. You know, um, apparently the reasons for him not being considered a psychoanalyst were a little bit political, you know, and, uh, and he got really, really frustrated. But that also, of course, he turned it around and he started writing his ideas and it was incredible. And, and it's interesting. I think one of the things that um, I think I can contribute with uh, is by saying that uh, don't always believe Burn when he says he's not doing psychoanalysis. Yeah. <laughs> it's, not that he's, it's not that he's flat out lying, but he's actually trying not to step on anyone's toes mm. right mm. he's trying mm. not to not to be controversial or perhaps not to be questioned you know who is this guy he's not recognized as a psychoanalyst but um everything that he does write is very psychoanalytic so mm. uh, the the first thing that i would like to say is um, for me, TA as Byrne started it, not TA nowadays because it has, I understand, developed uh, into something much bigger. But yeah. the way that Byrne conceived it, it was psychoanalytic to the core. And you would find parallels in uh, several different psychoanalytic schools nowadays. Um, and uh, especially psychoanalysis developed uh, a lot into the relational field, which is something that you would also find a lot of similarities with TA. This is why uh, I've seen a lot, of, um, a lot of people referring to TA as a neo-psychoanalytic theory, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in the way that it's a modern twist on or, or a modern take on, on psychoanalysis. And, uh, and it does fit, you know, and uh, one of the things that testifies to that is that you do find people referring to 
there is there are even books called uh, um, uh, transactional psychoanalysis. I think Michele Novellino has a book. Yeah, yeah. By, that goes by that title, and then you have authors such as Carlo Moiso, and even some of the relational authors. Uh, mm. Uh, Charlotte Sills, they, they do uh, use a lot of concepts or ideas that are either uh, things that began with psychoanalysis or are very similar to what psychoanalysis has come to be in the past few years. You know, so for me, studying TA, I was home from the very beginning, mm, you know, mm. Yeah. And uh, what attracted me to TA basically was the language. You know, I uh, I do believe I, I, that one of the main strengths of uh, of TA uh, and uh, is the is the psychoeducation. This is not exclusive to TA. For example, CBT does a lot of psychoeducation yeah. as well, um, but the idea of, of uh, doing psychoeducation is something that had always been very dear to me. I've always explained mm. uh, some of the psychoanalytic concepts to my patients. I refer to them as patients. This is usually how psychoanalysts, at least here in Brazil, refer to their clients, right? Uh, for me, clients doesn't sound... <laughs> that nice i don't know it's probably just me but yeah. then again uh so in in psychoanalysis um so usually you 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 won't find uh that all of the, uh, the the psychoanalysts use psychoeducation of course you know uh, but there are a few who do and i'm one of them mm. but then again it's much harder to explain to you, to somebody, to your patient or to your client uh, about ego, super ego and id. <laughs> it's yeah. much harder to talk in those terms than it is to talk about the child, the parent and the adult. Of course, I realize that those are not the same thing. There are differences. There, there is some, uh, well, the, there are some intersections, right? For example, Byrne says uh, that the that the id is the child within the child is what we call C one, mm. right? Mm. And uh, and the superego is uh, is pretty much contained in the parent, mm. right? So there is a lot of overlapping, you know. And uh, but it's much yeah. easier when you when you are talking to your your patient or your client, you know, to explain, uh, you know, that they are, they are listening to or talking to uh, other people in their heads, <laughs> yeah. right? And uh, to say, so for example, uh, I usually ask them questions such as, who's judging you? Who's mm. demanding that from you? And usually mm. uh, before TA, you know, I would struggle with that, with asking that question because it would take some understanding from the patients to realize that they are not really responding to themselves. But the most, mm. the, the quickest answer is I'm only responding to myself. I'm the one who is yeah. uh, all that pressure on me. And then of course you have to go on and, and make them realize that perhaps the pressure they feel has to do with the way they were brought up and the, the pressure that their parents put on them, you know, it's not very, it's not very easy sometimes. Uh, you know, you have to w really work around those things. But once you introduce them to the concept of the child, the adult, uh, and the parent, uh, it's much easier to, to get them to understand, oh, okay, so this is your parent talking, right? And uh, mm. it, it, it it's much easier to break the ice and to get them to understand uh, you know, so I think it enables them a lot. And I have a lot of uh, patients or, or clients who come to me and say, Oh, this week I heard my parents talking to my child. Oh, this week I had an argument with my wife and it was very hard to stay on adult 
I realized mm. that my child felt this and this and that. And it's amazing, you know, because it gives yeah. them some fresh perspective. I agree. I, agree. I think that psychoeducation, as uh, we talk about uh, strengthening the adult, right? And uh, this is one of the... Um, uh, this is one of the main goals for the um, for the the school uh, for for the ego we call it the ego psychology school, which is yeah. Yeah. which is the school that prevailed in the the IPA, right? Which is the International Psychoanalytic Society uh, Association. So the and I think... is... yeah, sorry. You... Oh, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the point you're making was really one of the goals that Eric Byrne had in mind to have a simple language, to make the client and, and, the, and the therapist in an equal place of contracting and ma make it actually easier to do a psycho psychoeducation and people can really have a better understanding in a much quicker time. But on the other hand, some people believe that uh, TA language became so simplistic, and some people believe that it started very psychoanalytic, but that Bernd's theory ended in a cognitive behavioral um, approach. It, it ended, the latest theory was more cognitive behavioral than psychoanalytic. And it's interesting that uh, what I uh, observed in my searching, some people have more emphasis in one part of the theory and other people have more emphasis in uh, another part, if, depending on the school of they are working and the modalities there they prefer to work. So um, how, how did you see that? Well, Ash, um, you know, you, you do know that CBT also came from psychoanalysis. Right. It, was <laughs> psychoanal true. it was psychoanalysis that introduced the idea, you know, that you have um, that, that you have to undo uh, one's fantasies. Right. And when, when we talk about fantasies is, you know, the way I play out the situations in my head. Hmm. Right. So uh, even today I was talking to uh, a patient you know, who always sees uh, that he has a debt with everyone. So with his friends, you know, when his friends do something nice towards him, uh, he, he feels that he has a debt towards them. And this comes from his mother. His mother was the one who started this, who put him in that position, right? So... Uh, so when you when you clarify you know the fantasies and and when you make people realize that the way that things play out in their heads is not exactly the same as what's going on in reality what you're doing is very similar to cbt you know mm -hmm. so uh it's very hard to say where where does one end and where does the other one start for me, yeah. I read Burn and I see psychoanalysis from the beginning till the end. I do not see that shift that people sometimes see, you know. And uh, being a psychoanalyst, I can I can confidently say that the shift is not there. <laughs> it's what people think. Mm -hmm. I, I can see that Burn was always extra care careful in not stepping, you know, into somebody else's toes, like I said. He was very careful. He said, I'm Freudian, but I'm not a psychoanalyst. What is he saying you know, when he <laughs> says that? You know? Yeah. But yeah. then again, uh, Freud was very, was very much into investigation, much more than in establishing a, uh, a systematic approach to therapy. You know, uh, Bern does try a systematic approach in some of his books, but Freud didn't. Freud, his works are, are all about his investigations and his experiences with his clients. So people take from Freud what they want, you know, and, yeah. uh, and, and usually one, 
uh, one school of psychoanalysis will accuse the other of not being Freudian enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, TA would, would fit well in, in, in that fold should it choose to, you know. But then again, I think uh, something good came out of Byrne trying to avoid uh, the, the psychoanalytic term, which was, you know, some space for other theories to also bring in techniques and interesting things such as Gestalt and yeah. such as CBT, you know. And uh, for, for many psychoanalysts, it, it's not okay to, uh, to blend these things into psychoanalysis, you know. But others, you know, will not really talk that openly about it, but are not so... Um, are not so strict. Freud was not very strict at all. He tried several different things, you know. So the thing is, what makes psychoanalysis psychoanalysis is its objective. Psychoanalysis is all about making the unconscious conscious, right? Or even making the pre-conscious conscious, you know, because th there are both things in, in psychoanalysis and people usually do not make a distinction between them. And Byrne does, you know. Interestingly mm -hmm. enough, Byrne's distinction between the unconscious and the pre-conscious is actually yeah. one of yeah. the best that I've read. And Byrne also wrote a book, which is an introduction to psychoanalysis. So, you know, I, I don't see Byrne as uh, walking away from psychoanalysis. In fact, there are some people who say that in his... Uh, in, in his own private practice, he used a lot of psychoanalysis. And, but I can understand why he chose to avoid the, the jargon and, and also maybe the, limit, the limits that the jargon would, would bring. You know, Lacan, uh, you know, he, he went on and he did his, he, he created his own thing. You know, he said he was being Freudian, but he created an entirely new clinic yeah, and methods and, and, and theories and all, you know, based on Freud, but he has a lot of ideas that are not really Freud's. Uh, but that's the thing, you know, he broke off from the, fr from the IPA, much like Byrne did, but he kept calling himself a psychoanalyst. You yeah. know, that was the yeah. difference between Lacan and, and, and Byrne. And, and for me, that's but basically the only difference. Mm. You but know? you think that breaking of creates a space of creativity and openness to other modalities. And even in philosophical roots, it's interesting you mentioned. So people say TA are humanistic. Some people say it's existential because it's sometimes emphasizing on free will or uh, it's emphasizing on personal responsibility and these things. And uh, especially the concept of physis that's like self-actualization tendency that is in humanistic approaches. And these can sometimes be uh, different to some theories or uh, schools of psychoanalysis or sometimes can be similar. Right. Right. Uh, perfect. I think, I think you were, you, you hit the nail on the head and it's interesting, you know, because, uh, Richard Erskine uh, is, says to, is said to have a, an integrative approach, right? Mm. A, a, an integrative approach. Uh, but that's the thing. Uh, that's what's funny because TA is integrative. It's already you know? so yeah. it's, al yeah. it's already integrative. So <laughs> uh, I understand why he calls it that. I'm not, uh, I, I want to make, make sure people understand I'm not criticizing him at all. I understand why he did that, but it shouldn't really, uh, he shouldn't really have had to do so, you know, because it is integrative, uh, integrative in, a, in, a, uh, in its core, you know, and I like that. And uh, I think TA um, uh, basically defines itself uh, by its three goals, right? This is how I see TA. Uh, TA is all about um, is all about reparenting or replacing the parent. I don't like the term replace very much, but let's 
let's say that's why I say reparenting, mm. uh, strengthening the adult, right, and deconfusing the child, right? Yeah. So yeah, uh, the the way I see it, how you go about those things is what's really going to define to define your your uh, clinical work. And your your clinical work uh, is not always going to be. Uh, it's not going to be TA alone. You know, it's mm. going to be TA blended with something, you know, mm. and that's, yeah. uh, and so, you know, people will bring in different techniques for those goals. And of course, as someone, as a psychoanalyst, uh, my main, my main work is with, uh, deconfusing the, the child. Right. And, mm. uh, uh, which is bringing the unconscious conscious. But of course, I do find myself doing a lot of strengthening the adult or reparenting, especially reparenting, especially with uh, psychotic patients, right? They need a lot of reparenting. But even in psychoanalysis, the position of the therapist with psychosis is different. It's more of a parent and less of a, uh, you know, yeah. of, uh, of a peer. So what I hear is like, for you, TA is giving a framework exactly. that you can integrate everything into it or any, any other technique from everywhere. And I think um, what Richard Erskine sometimes means is, is like uh, having the theory or having the basic understanding of TA, but adding a lot of things from self-psychology uh, or object relations theory gestalt techniques and, and, and lo lots of things but he can point out where he's working with the parent interject where he, when he is doing a redecision work in he, he has a book integrative psychotherapy in action which is all about redecision work and when he's doing uh, work with adult yeah but um, probably we can understand all of it in this framework exactly Exactly. And uh, even though uh, uh, I didn't make, uh, well, I haven't made because I can always change, right? But I haven't made the same technical choices uh, for my clinic that Richard Erskine uh, did. Or maybe uh, I, I do understand some TA concepts in a different light than what he does because I'm a different person. I'm a different therapist. But I do sure. agree a lot with him in terms of integrating the different techniques and the different uh, skills, you know, because that's being Freudian. Freud was um, not what, what some people make him to be, especially the quote-unquote orthodox Freudians, which is, uh, which is almost an abomination, a linguistic abomination, because if there's one thing that Freud wasn't is orthodox, he would mm. have dinner with his patients. He would take them for a walk in the park. He would give money to them even. <laughs> give money to them. He would yeah. uh, write letters and, and make interpretations based on what yeah. they wrote in the letters. You know, some things that would probably have a lot of psychoanalysts crying foul right uh and uh, and so freud was all about okay so i have this human being in front of me how mm. do i get him better and mm. and i guess we we, do, we we shouldn't lose that perspective and that's what burn also said so burn was very freudian in in i think in in the sense that he got freud he understood mm quite well what Freud was trying to do, you know, and the way he talks about the life script is brilliant, you know, and, and, and it's interesting because this is a concept that Byrne himself says originates from Freud's interpretation yeah. of, yeah. He, of the work of the, yeah. the life of Leonardo da Vinci. And, and, and that's the thing, you know, that's one of the books, that's one of Freud's books, which is usually frowned upon because Freud was wrong in, in several aspects of his 
interpretation of Leonardo yeah. da Vinci's life. I think it was really Leonardo da Vinci. I could be wrong, but I think it was Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, forgive me if I have the wrong guy, but the idea is the same. He was wrong uh, about a, a, a number of things. And, and then people just threw away everything that he t attempted to do. Oh, it's not valid, you know, because you didn't have, he didn't have access to this and that and that information. Okay, yeah. but what about the technique? What, what about what he was attempting to do? And, yeah. and Byrne rescues that technique and uses that to develop the idea of a live script, you know? And uh, yeah. it's, it's amazing. It blends in very well with Freud's uh, concept of uh, repetition compulsion and also yeah. Freud's Just concept. Just wanted to say that. Yeah, I wanted to say sometimes people make new language for for the same idea and said it's a new thing or it's it's something different. The the article of William Cornell points out this very clearly. That's theory and psychoanalysis, the narcissism of small differences, the title. And That's a brilliant article, by the way. There, yeah, it is really, yeah. It shows how this, these can all be similar in some ways, but uh, emphasizing the differences uh, will just make us what we call in TA terms discounting the other exactly. person. Yeah, exactly. uh, the theory or understanding of an, another, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly it. That there's a lot of discounting. And, and that article was brilliant, brilliant. And I think that's what makes a good therapist is not, is, it's not about the technique that you use because there are many ways of doing the same thing, you know? Yeah. And, if, and a good therapist is always uh, keeping in touch with techniques and schools of thought and work. And, and I think what's precious about TA is, is exactly the fact that it puts you in contact with people that work in very different styles and, and this mm. brings growth, mm. right? So my sure. style of working is psychoanalytic. I don't see myself changing styles, you know, because I can only speak for myself in the present. Mm. Maybe I will. The future belongs to God or the universe or whatever one believes in <laughs> but um uh but that's the thing you know nowadays i see myself uh, i'm a psychoanalyst and i continue to be a psychoanalyst my goal is not to become a transactional analyst but a but a transactional psychoanalyst you know and yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think it's it's a goal for a lifetime. It's not a goal that I will achieve when, once I get this or that certification because that really doesn't change anything. Me too. It's, it's all yeah, about the right. I, I, <laughs> I totally agree. I totally agree, right. Yeah. And, and what you say about <clears throat> being in contact with people, I really found TA community so welcoming and especially <clears throat> uh, when contacting them, everybody... Uh, shares ideas and helps to gain a better understanding. And I see you're very active in putting ideas and questions in some groups and asking for people's ideas. And I totally I agree that uh, what, what makes you a better therapist in this is the openness to, to everything and new understanding and just being in contact with different schools and theories and everything. I, I love, you know, reading something and thinking, oh, this is awesome. This is really <laughs> good food for thought. <laughs> I wonder what <laughs> other people have to say about this, you know, and then yeah. just posting it online and watching for the reactions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love doing yeah. that. A great discussions you know, I, underneath your questions every time. <laughs> indeed and and it's quite it's quite rich because uh some of those discussions have really got me to think a lot not only about the discussion itself but my practice you know and and my yeah. choices and and when you have this encounter you know it takes you to unforeseen places mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Well, so then I, I'd like us to conclude the discussion. I think we already reached a good point that about this having this openness and flexibility, uh, whatever we are doing. But uh, now I want to conclude how each of these theories you think so far has contributed your own practice. If you want to mention some points about that. Um, sure. Uh, well, you, when you say, but let me just uh, ask for some clarification. Are you talking about the different schools in TA or TA and psychoanalysis? I'm talking about TA and psychoanalysis. Okay. Well, uh, psychoanalysis introduced me to one of the most precious things uh, and, and it was a life-changing uh, experience for me, which is the idea that things are not always what they seem, you know? Words don't always mean what they appear to mean. People mm -hmm. uh, are not always, uh, actually most of the time, people are not really saying what they are speaking. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and so the idea, you know, of this whole unconscious world that unfolds right before your eyes is fascinating. And it was a life-changing experience for me. And, uh, and so, and this, this is something that I will always cherish a lot. Um, and as, and TA, uh, gave me, you know, the means, I believe, to share this experience in a, in a more humanistic kind of way and also mm. in, a, uh, in a way that people can relate better, you know? Mm. So Maybe more uh, objective, I think. Exactly. Uh, so for me, psychoanalysis was all, was all about looking... Uh, looking into myself, right? Uh, and, and I think this is something that, it, that everybody should do, you know, take a, take a really good look in the mirror and, and really see, you know? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and TA was all about looking at other people, you know? Of mm. course, you can, you can look at other people through psychoanalysis and you can look within you know, from a TA With perspective, TA. I'm, yeah. I'm talking about my own personal experience, yeah. you know, so both really contributed a lot to my own and have, uh, and have been contributing because this is an endless process to my own personal growth. And I think a good therapist is, is one, you know, that keeps growing and helping people uh, helping people find a way to grow as well. Well, yeah, yeah. And that, well, that's an interplay and dynamic between that because f for sure what you're seeing in other people, the uh, transactions you're having with people will tell you something about yourself and something's happening within you. And then again, what, what you see in yourself, then it's being enacted in dynamics with people and uh, so I think each each one of these help us to, with both as you said exactly yeah it's sort of a quote-unquote artificial division right but yeah you're yes. absolutely right everything contributes to knowledge in general both of self and of the world mm -hmm. yeah um, oh, okay thank you Louis, so are there any suggestions you want to make for people who like to um, start to make, bridge or make connections between these these two discourses? Maybe we can, if we can say uh, psychoanalysis and TA. Personally, I, for example, I can say um, read each of the theorists in TA and and see what do they put emphasis on and my personal experience was that when I went to read more of that emphasis or more of that theory in psychoanalysis I got a better understanding so I want to know uh, your suggestions and well for uh, for TA people um, I would say 
remember that Byrne also wrote an introduction to psychoanalysis. So go mm -hmm. ahead and read that and uh, reread Byrne's uh, references to psychoanalysis alongside a good uh, introductory book. There are several books on introduction to psychoanalysis and, you know, just choose the one that, um, you know, speaks to you in a language that you can relate to. And for psychoanalysts, well, I, uh, what I would recommend, it's hard not to recommend the journey that I took, which is uh, start with the games, you know, because the games are fascinating. Mm. You know, <laughs> start with the dictionary of games and games people play, and then move on to uh, transactional analysis and psychotherapy, or perhaps what do you say after you say hello? you know, which are, which, uh, are yeah. really brilliant books. And then, of course, there is uh, Michele Novellino's book on transactional psychoanalysis, which I would recommend to both, you know, because it, it, it's really, really interesting and really sheds a lot of light. Yeah, especially in practice. There, there are lots of ideas about transference, different kinds of uh, transference and counter-transference and... Um, it's interesting how how they uh, actually made a new theory of getting from both of those. And that's a great book. Exactly. And always, I, I think one of the greatest contributions we can give to those who are starting uh, this journey uh, as a therapist, for example, um, is um, to always think in practical terms, how is this helping me understand mm -hmm. my client you know and uh and keep the client as the focus and the center of the experience i think that's the most important thing sure yeah i really enjoyed this talk today. And me too it was know, a pleasure it, it, it's a topic to. i i really enjoy and i learned a lot from you and your point of view uh yeah. so Let's see. If you know, the feeling is mutual, right? <laughs> I learned a lot <laughs> from you. Not only, not only did I learn a lot from you here, but I always learn a lot from you in our classes with Julie. Uh, thank <laughs> you. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Uh, so Aggie's thing, Curious, comes to mind. And uh, that's very interesting. It made me reflect on what kind of therapist I am and I'm becoming. Thank you both. So thank you for being in this talk with us. I think about 10 people were here coming and going. Uh, so nice. if there's any, any questions, um, just put, put for us in the comments. And this live video will be saved. And I, I'll probably put it on YouTube too. So yeah, we'll probably also... have a lot more than 10 people watching those. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Most it's people don't watch like... live. <laughs> Yeah, it's usually like that. And if you're watching it later, just put comments for us or if any questions, you can uh, contact. Very uh, nice to connect with people. It's always nice. Yeah. So it seems like there is no comment. So I think we can end this. And I know you have a client just after, after this time. <laughs> so, all right thank you Ash. it was a pleasure being here with you today thanks very much i hope i hope we can talk another time too of yeah. course of course <laughs> let's yeah. do that again <laughs> all right yeah, see, see you, you soon see you yeah <laughs> bye everyone bye bye